I lost all self-esteem, I lost all self-worth. I had no purpose in life. Um, and I thought they would be better off um, if I wasn't around. I borrowed a gun and um, that midday one day I put the gun to my head in my lounge room. Basically nobody was really listening. I don't think anybody really wanted to know. Returning vets bring back with them an accumulation of body-based traumas. They've had threats to their lives or things they've witnessed that have gone inside them. And these body memories get triggered and activated and interfere with their life. Shopping was difficult. Um, I could get probably halfway around a shopping centre and then have to leave the trolley and get outside. I had to find space, I had to get fresh air. The strongest uh, trigger for a flashback for me was smell. Um, a, like a sickly sweet smell would take me straight back to the morgue. It was a similar smell to decaying flesh. And when those images appear in your head from a, a flashback or a trigger like that, it's like you're actually really there. Just you get those snippets of operation or but when something's going wrong and it's out of your control. You sort of run out of ammunition at the wrong time or trying to get somebody out that 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 that, that would haunt me. And if it's extreme enough, they can no longer cope. And if they cannot cope, they start to medicate, if they start to medicate, then they go become at risk for a number of problems. Losing their family, losing their jobs, uh, dissolution of, of relationships. My ex-wife and my children were constantly walking on eggshells. I was very, very angry and bitter and I would transfer that anger onto my children um, verbally. It was quite a terrifying experience for them. So instead of being a strong, compassionate, nurturing father, I became a bit of a monster that they um, had to avoid for their own survival. Many modern day soldiers are very aware that they are going to collect, as they call it, baggage of the war that they want to drop. They're young and very vulnerable to trauma. So that's why the program now has been offered. This is what is required. This is what a lot of guys look for and, and have looked for, but never been able to get. And we're just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, there's guys like me all over Australia and, um, and not necessarily just veterans, but, but guys that have served in the Defence Force in any situation could really use this kind of work. Usually it's a retreat for a number of days. They eat together, they share dorms which are like barracks, they have downtime where they actually end up talking till two in the morning. Soldiers know how to help soldiers, so we, we take advantage of that. It's like a rebuilding of a community, so it's, it's a group-based intervention where there's a lot of support from them and from us, the professional team. Okay, so Todd, uh, we just leave the chairs where they are. Uh, as you know, we start by getting up and walking, moving, you know, getting mobilized, because often when we're, when we're walking and talking, it's a little easier to uh, kind of regulate ourselves. Uh, military people are really action trained. So the best therapeutic correction wouldn't be sitting and talking. That would feel awkward, uncomfortable, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't probably trust it as much. This is, the, this is Chris, the guy we heard about before. So what we do is we recreate scenes and moments from their past through action methods. Often they've lost buddies who've been killed in action. They never got to say goodbye to them. They will choose someone to be that person. They will talk to them and say goodbye and release a lot of the grieving that they need to do. Their eyes closed now? Yeah, his eyes are closed. He's He's unconscious. We were barely keeping him alive. When um, people are in the middle of reenacting a very stressful event, thoughts are, aren't very clear, they have a lot of emotion, and they know they want to say something, but they can't think of the words. But we know from our own research that there's certain things that have to be said at certain critical recovery moments, which are very simple and straightforward, but they have to say it. I look, I'm aware. I'm aware that Chris is barely alive. He's still and then I am feeling helpless so what we would do is we would lead him 
with a sentence of uh, what I need to say to you is and if he doesn't know what to say I'm so sorry but because we know him and we know the context we have an understanding of what it is he needs to say there is nothing there is nothing I can do right now I can do right now. to reverse what happened in this accident to reverse what happened in this accident yeah. Men in our country are socialized to not share emotions. Uh, it's unmanly, but they soon discover that the way back for recovery and healing is to do just the very thing they're taught not to. I was there when they conducted the autopsy on you. Mm. The I hardest. had to be there to protect you, mm. to guard you. And I wanted to do it so your family knew that you were not alone. Mm. And I did that. And I did that for you. Our, our minds can't always differentiate between that reenactment from the original event. So they're able to go back into the story and finish it in a way that the helplessness is, is eliminated. And from then on, uh, they, they have a different experience, a, di a different relationship with that traumatic event. Even though the rational part of your brain says, it's not really them. There's a part of you that thinks it is and that you really are back there and they're now alive and talking to you. It's incredibly powerful. Chris, I need to say to you that I'm sorry that you're passing. I'm sorry that you died. I feel that I failed you and that I couldn't help you and I couldn't save you and I can't let go of that and that hurts me. I would never abandon you. And I can't forgive myself for it. And I can't forgive myself for it. There's nothing you can do. And I want you to hear that. And I want you to hear that. And I need you to let go of this and to get on with your life. And I need you to let go of this and to get on with your life. And you will never be forgotten. The telling your story and enacting your story about your fears and your regrets and so on makes an internal state external and they feel relief and can let it go so that they can use energy to get on with their lives. You won't return in my dreams. You won't return in my dreams. We're finished because you're all with me. We're finished because you're all with me. You might inside me. So, so, and that, so I'm going to cover you up. I'm going to cover you up. I'm going to walk out of the room. And then I'm going to walk out of the room. And I'm going to walk into the rest of my life. And I'm going to walk into the rest of my life. And there was closure almost relief. It was incredibly emotional. So I was quite exhausted at the end of it too, but um, I felt much the better for it for having done it. That's for sure. When you're walking in that circle and enacting your work, you're in the moment in it. And the uh, realization of what has changed in you, what has taken place, the sort of the complexity of it hits you later. And what we do is sit and look at their process. I'm asking them in each moment as we go through the video recall is to pinpoint places where something has changed. They notice some different emotion or they notice some different cognition or different feeling. And I'm trying to get under that to figure out uh, what that means. So when you were touching your face, what was, what was that? I don't know. I think it was just like a nervous, um, maybe I'm trying to mask yeah, my emotions from yeah. the group. When I notice something that's changed or I, I see an insight that's taken place, I cue and I stop and say, what was going on for you in that moment? So when they answer that question, they're bringing to mind what they were experiencing, but also what that meant to them. What was the meaning made there? I don't, I don't remember this part of the, uh, at all. So you went, you went somewhere, I guess. But you were saying all the words. Mm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's it like to see this now? Uh, it's it's a bit of a shock. It's like the, some kind of defense mechanism has kicked in and yeah, protecting you because mm. it was really hard. There's a lot of insight and a lot of emotion comes up while they're watching what they did. It's a difficult thing to go back and relive that whole enactment, uh, but it's very beneficial to their to the change to the healing process. Look, I wish I had done the course years ago. It's opened up a new way of thinking about things and it's 
I've got to meet some great guys that I have, now have the most up, utmost respect for. It's helped us build bridges um, with our families, ex-partners, and with ourselves to deal with, um, you know, our emotional problems. I had a dream last night, standing at an airport, waiting for my luggage to come down. All the baggage was actually passing me by, and I couldn't find my baggage. I woke up with a smile on my face, and thinking that's very, very true. I don't know where my baggage is now. This course has helped me considerably to get rid of a lot. I don't seem to have that tension and stress that used to bottle me up. Um, I've had a huge release of emotions. Um, I know I'm not out of the woods yet, there's still a long way to go, but um, I've been given a bit more hope and a lot more optimism, optimism about the future, so um, I'm now keen to move forward and, and get on with my life instead of regretting it.